Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Lapsley. I'm an engineering manager at uh, Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud, formerly uh, MetaCloud. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing on uh, VXLAN and on a distributed VXLAN service node. Uh, this is joint work. Uh, my collaborators there, Chet Burgess, who's our chief architect, and Kahal Lay, who's one of our senior software engineers. Before I start, I'd just like to get an idea of kind of uh, how many folks in the room actually know uh, about VXLAN. Could you show me with a raise of hands? Oh, wow. That's impressive. Last time I gave this talk, I think there were only a few people, so this is great. Uh, and how many folks here are actually uh, engineers working on OpenStack? OK, wow. This is OK, very good. So I'd like to start by, I'll go through the introduction sli slides very quickly and get to the interesting stuff. Um, but I'd like to start briefly by motivating uh, VXLAN, uh, how it's kind of come about, and other technologies like it. So, we all know over the last decade or so, virtualization in the de data center has really changed uh, dramatically um, the network requirements. So we have virtualization on hypervisors. So instead of single physical servers now, we have 10, 20, maybe 100 virtual servers that look like physical servers to the switches. Uh, so it's an order of magnitude or, or more increase in the, in the number of end hosts. Similarly, the number of networks has increased and also bandwidth requirements continue to go up. So this is a bit of a problem for traditional data center networks. And the reason is because they were designed with L2 access aggregating into an L3 uh, IP core. And so there's a couple of uh, inefficiencies with this. First of all, you have wasted uh, capacity. So using STP, which you need to do uh, at L2 to prevent uh, routes in your network topology, that blocks a lot of ports in the network. And so you have wasted capacity there. You also have VLAN exhaustion. So we use, uh, at L2, we use 802.1Q labels to actually segregate uh, um, uh, different networks, different tenants. And so with a single 802.1Q label, you only have uh, up to 4, 000, roughly 4,000 VLAN IDs. And this is a problem when you have more than 4,000 tenants in a single data center. And each one of those tenants might have a lot more, uh, might have a lot of networks. Top of rack scalability as well. So now you have an increase in the number of L2 endpoints, so you also need to increase your, L2, uh, your hardware tables and your top of rack routers. So pushing L3 all the, way, all the way to the edge is something that can actually help with this. So L3 is scalable, it's well known and supported, it's been around for a long time, uh, people are very familiar with it, has equal cost multi-path routing, so it means you can have all of your links active, uh, they, you can maximize your link utilization. There's a challenge, though, and the challenge is we need to still be able to scope our tenants and projects. How do we actually scope networks within this L3 network? And that's where VXLAN and other uh, IP overlay networks come into play. So VXLAN is basically a, a MAC over UDP IP overlay network. So it takes uh, layer two frames on a hypervisor or at an endpoint, and it encapsulates them in a, in a UDP over IP packet. It reuses the existing IP core, so you get uh, L3 ECMP. It reduces the pressure uh, on your Tor L2 tables because now the switches are just seeing a single uh, physical endpoint, uh, a single physical endpoint for the tunnels that are going across them, but within those tunnels are encapsulated multiple virtual endpoints. It also supports over 16 million VLAN or virtual network IDs, not VLANs, but virtual network IDs and it maintains your existing layer two bridging semantics. So from the networking perspective at the endpoints, it looks exactly like a layer two, uh, layer two uh, domain. So here's what VXLAN encapsulation looks like. So you basically take from your, uh, say your VM on your hypervisor, you take an L2 packet from that, it's got its destination MAC, source MAC, 802.1Q label, ether type, payload, and so on. You take all of that and you put it into uh, an encapsulating packet. So our packet goes into here. We put a VXLAN header on top of it. And really, the only field that's important to us is this VXLAN network identifier, or VNI. And this is what gives us 16 million unique v uh, virtual networks. And then in the encapsulating packet, we have the outer UDP header, the outer IP header, and then the outer MAC. Uh, and of course, that's the source and destination MACs. So there are three basic components to VXLAN. So you have your virtual network identifier, so 16 million uh, unique virtual identifiers. You have your VX tunnel endpoint, and this is responsible for doing the encapsulation and the de uh, decapsulation 
of traffic as it's, uh, as it's coming out of an endpoint or going into an endpoint. The VTEPs actually listen, well, there's two ports that they listen on. The, I, I, the IANA standard is to listen on port 4789, but by default in the Linux kernel, you actually listen on port 8472. And then one of the very important components uh, of the XLAN is actually how you maintain the VNI to VTEP IP mapping. And I'll talk about that in detail um, as we progress. So here's an example of the XLAN deployment. So you have two hypervisors. They're connected over an L3 network. Each of the hypervisors has virtual machines from two different tenants. So we have a blue tenant and a red tenant. And you can see uh, on hypervisor one here, we have a VTEP, which is basically a tunnel endpoint. And we have the same, uh, we also have a VTEP for uh, the second hypervisor there. On top of the VTEP, we would normally build a bridge, an L2 bridge, so that we can have multiple VMs from that tenant actually connecting into the bridge uh, so that those VMs can send their packets over the bridge, over the VTEP, then over this tunnel here, which I've labeled VXLAN 100, to the uh, end VTEP where it's decapsulated, sent out onto the tenant bridge, and then uh, makes its way to the other uh, virtual machines there. So VM 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, either in the blue tenant or the red tenant, look like they're all on the same L2 domain. And over here, you can see the various stages of encapsulation. I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, all of these slides are actually going to be, uh, I'll have a link at the end uh, to all of these slides, so you can download them if you like. So one of the challenges, though, is how the XLAN is point-to-point. -point. We've talked about a point-to-point -point tunneling mechanism. So how does VXLAN actually deal with broadcast unknown or multicast packets? Packets that it doesn't really, that either have to go to everybody or packets that uh, have an unknown destination. So there are basically two mechanisms. There's actually quite a few more, but they fall into, into the two basic categories. So one mechanism is actually to use multicast. So whenever a VTEP comes up, well actually whenever, so for any VTEP or any VNI, you actually have an associated multicast group. So when the first VM on a particular VTEP comes up, that means that that VTEP actually wants to listen for broadcast traffic. So it sends an IGMP join to the group so that it can actually receive multicast traffic sent to that particular group. Whenever the last VM on a particular VTEP is spun down and there are no longer any uh, VMs on that particular VTEP, that VTEP doesn't need to receive any broadcast traffic anymore because it has no destination. And so it actually sends an IGMP leave and it, it removes itself from the multicast group. Whenever uh, a VTEP receives a, a, a broadcast unknown or multicast packet, it actually sends it to that multicast group and the multicast group then sends it to all of the other VTEPs that are associated with that virtual network. So it's kind of like a, a unicast implementation, well, it's a multicast implementation of broadcast. The second approach is to use a service node, and this is what we're going to be talking about. And the idea here is that you have a central, uh, a central node that just sits there and maintains the mapping from uh, VTEPs to, uh, sorry, from VNIs to the IP addresses of all the VTEPs that belong to those virtual networks. And so whenever a VTEP needs to send a broadcast uh, unknown or multicast packet, it actually sends it to that central node. That node will actually do a lookup in its table. It'll figure out where, uh, who all of the uh, corresponding VTEPs, their IP addresses are, and it will broadcast, not broadcast, it'll actually send or flood to each one of those VTEPs. The multicast mechanism uh, is usually, well, it, multicast has a number of challenges. First of all, you need to have support from the underlying network, and then you also need to have the, the network configured appropriately, and this can be a bit problematic. So the service node uh, is a, a much more convenient option. So this is an example at a high level of how the service node works, and I'll go into a lot more detail shortly. So if we imagine we have traffic uh, going from VM2 to VM4. So none of, the, none of these VMs uh, on hypervisor 1, none of the red VMs on hypervisor 1 or hypervisor 2 know about each other. So VM2 will send its packet out under the bridge. The packet will go to uh, uh, the VTEP, VXLAN 101. 
that will actually not have it in its forwarding database. And so, well, actually, initially what will happen is an ARP request will come in, which is a broadcast packet. So VXLAN 101 will see that it's a broadcast packet, and it will send it to the service node. The service node is then going to do a lookup, and it's going to see that for VNI 101, it has two VTEPs, 3333 and 4444. And so now it knows that the packet just came from 3333, so it's going to send the packet to 4444. So when VXLAN 101 receives a packet, it decapsulates it, puts it on the bridge, and then uh, VM4 will pick it up and then respond. So here's a little bit more detail. This is a sequence diagram. So on hypervisor 1, we have VM1 and we have VTEP1, and then we have the corresponding VTEP and VM on hypervisor 2. So the ARP request goes from VM1 to VTEP1. It encapsulates the packet, sends it to the service node. The service node then looks up the address and floods the packet to all of those IPs. In this case, it was just one other IP, but in practice, there could be hundreds. VTEP2 uh, picks it up. It learns. So when it receives that packet, it knows the source IP of the sender, which is VTEP1, but it also knows the, uh, the source MAC, uh, the VTEP1 MAC, and it also knows VM1's uh, MAC and IP address as well. So it learns this and it learns that VM1 is reachable via VTEP1. And so when the ARP request goes through to VM3, uh, not VM2, as I put here, but VM3, VM3 will actually respond and send the response back. The response will hit VTEP2, it'll encapsulate the packet, and because it's already learned where VM1 is, it's going to send that packet directly back to VTEP1, so it doesn't need to go to the service node. VTEP1, in turn, from that packet, will learn that VM3 is reachable via VM2. And so it's only the first packet that needs to get sent to the service node. All of the other packets, by the time they've done their exchange, the state is already set up on both ends so that they know how to uh, reach each other. And then the ARP response from VM2 will reach VM1, and then VM1 presumably will send a data packet uh, that'll be encapsulated, make its way through, and they'll continue their exchange. So that's basically how the service node works. So the simplest implementation of a service node is just to have a single node, a central service node here. So here we have uh, a large number of hypervisors. They only have two tenants, red and blue. They're all connected to an L3 network. And they all, all of their VTEPs will point to the single service node. Or it could be a, a cluster for HA. The problem is, if that service node goes down, then you basically can't do any more learning. It's not possible to send broadcast unknown or multicast packets anymore. So your network is down. So the solution, or one solution, is to actually distribute the service node functionality. So instead of just having a single service node, you could have local service nodes on all of the hypervisors. You can use a distributed cache with replication so that you have redundancy uh, and also, um, um, well, basically redundancy uh, in where you store your distributed data. All of those V all of those virtual distributed service nodes could pull data from the distributed cache and write data to the distributed cache. And that way, they're all storing exactly, they're all sharing state via the distributed cache. The advantage of this is now we don't have a single point of failure, and we also don't have a single bottleneck from a performance perspective. So we could lose one node, everything would keep working. We could lose another node, and we'd still be able to, to, to manage, even a third node. The number of nodes that you would need to lose before you lost connectivity is going to depend on the replication factor, on the pattern of, of the node failures, and so on. So that's what we did. So here's the basic design. So first of all, we have, uh, in our deployments, we have three controller nodes uh, in quorum uh, for HA purposes. We have, uh, in this case, 500 hypervisors that are all serviced by those three controllers. So this is an example. One of the things I forgot to mention is that with the distributed service node, you have a lot of flexibility in how you deploy things. Um, you do need a distributed service node on each one of the hypervisors, but your distributed cache could be on all of, all of your nodes or it could be on a subset of nodes. It's totally up to you. So in this case, we're going to put, uh, we have three controllers. We have our hypervisors. We're going to add a distributed service node to each of the hypervisors. The VTEPs point to those distributed service nodes. We have uh, a memcache cluster that's fronted by MicRouter. So uh, 
Uh, so McRouter is actually a product that, uh, or uh, some software that came out of Facebook. It's a memcache protocol router. And it's what they put in front of their memcache clusters. It offers, it has uh, a, a wide variety of functionality. One of the things it can do is replication and failover. So you get that basically for free. So Facebook uses it, and I think they have something like, at peak, uh, at peak traffic time, they have something like 5 billion queries per second going through their McRouter cluster. So it's pretty impressive. So then each of the distributed service nodes points to uh, a pool of these, uh, of, the, of these McRouter or a pool of these uh, McRouter endpoints. So anytime this node here is, is writing into this instance here, its data will be replicated across all of these memcache router, uh, all of these memcache instances here, similarly for the other two. So each distributed node has a pool of these so that if the primary goes down, it can fail over to the next and so on. So as far as the implementation, it was actually pretty straightforward. Uh, it really didn't take very long. We have a multi-threaded Python program. We use multi-processing. And so it's actually more than multi-threaded. It looks like it's multi-threaded, but it's actually multi-process. So it means that you can, scale, uh, as, uh, uh, you can scale with the number of CPUs or cores you have on your boxes. It runs on every hypervisor. It shares state using the distributed cache, as I mentioned. It does basically two things. So the first thing that it does, it listens on its local host uh, for any new registrations. So any new VTEPs that come up. And then when those do come up, it'll make a note of that, and it will send the mapping and update the distributed cache so that all of the other distributed nodes know about this. The other thing it does is also listen for broadcast unknown and multicast packets, and then flood those to all of the VTEPs that are in the virtual network. So before, this was what the sequence diagram looked like. We had the hypervisor service node and then the second hypervisor. Now we actually have, on the transmission side, we have a local distributed service node. And that's really it. Um, and the only difference here is that we're actually sharing state with a distributed cache rather than a central server. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we configure VXLAN, and then I'll give you a demo uh, of, uh, of this in action. So to create, create a VXLAN interface, you basically just use your IP link or your IP route tools. So we're adding an interface called VXLAN1. The type is VXLAN, we give it an ID, and then we point it to a remote. And so the remote is actually where we send broadcast unknown and multicast packets. Then in this case, we actually add an IP address. Uh, in an OpenStack deployment, you might just add a bridge, uh, and then your IPs or your virtual machines would actually uh, um, connect into that bridge. We set an MTU size so that we have enough room for the uh, VXLAN header, and then we bring it up. And so when we have a look at it, this is what you'll see if you do an IP adder show. You'll see the interface name, you'll see the IP address associated with it. So there's one really crucial part, uh, that, and this is, I've called it the CFB4 rule in honor of our chief architect because he came up with this, and this is actually really, really neat. This won't work the way VXLAN is currently implemented in the Linux kernel without this particular workaround, and I'll explain why. So what the VXLAN module does in the Linux kernel, it sits there, it binds to all of the IP addresses, and it listens on all interfaces on port 8472, or you can actually configure that port. And then when VXLAN packets come in, it, looks at, it decapsulates them, looks at the VNI, and sends those packets to the appropriate uh, VTEP. So ideally, what we would want to do is we would want any unknown packets from those VTEPs to be forwarded to our distributed service node. And so the, naively, we would bind to localhost port 8472, uh, and the idea being that these guys would forward their, uh, their unknown packets to here. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. And the reason that doesn't work is because the kernel is already bound to that port on all interfaces. And so you basically just can't bind to that because the kernel's already intercepting all of the packets. So that's where this rule comes in. So if you look at this rule, what it does, it basically does a destination NAT. So it sees packets coming in uh, on this IP address, which is an imaginary IP address. There's no IP address uh, assigned uh, on the system. Uh, UDP packets coming in on that address. 
and then it translates them, uh, sorry, destined for port 8472, the VXLAN port in the Linux kernel, and then it translates them to localhost on another port 8473 in this case, which is where we can actually bind. So there's broadcast and unknown packets come in here, they get intercepted in the kernel by IP tables, and then IP tables forward, forwards those packets to the VXLAN distributed service node, and that's how we're able to do this. All right, let's have a look at a demo. So this is the setup. So we have three virtual machines running on this laptop, and they're uh, um, basically pretending to be controllers, and they have memcache running on them, they have MIC router running on them, clustering the memcache. Uh, we have two hypervisor virtual machines. Each of them has three VTEPs for different tenants, and they're in three different networks. So they're in 172.16.1.4, this should be 2.4.3.4, and then 172.16.1.5, 2.5, 2.5, and 3.5. And then we have a distributed service nodes running on those. I should also mention at the end, I'll have a link to a GitHub repo that has Ansible playbook. So if you want to set this up yourself, uh, you can actually do that uh, by running, running the Ansible playbooks. Okay, so now let's see if we can bring up my terminal. Okay, that's good and see if I can find my other terminal. Great. So this terminal here with all the writing on it is actually uh, just a mon simple monitoring program that I wrote that logs into, every second it logs into both of the uh, MHVs and it pulls all of the interfaces, all the IP interfaces and it shows us uh, on MHV1 for example, it shows us the two physical ethernet interfaces, their MAC address, it shows us the VXLAN interfaces, which are both bound to Ethernet zero. Uh, and then soon we'll see ARP tables, uh, we'll see ARP entries for, uh, for VXLAN interfaces. And then here we have the forwarding database. So at the moment, the only thing in the forwarding database is the default forwarding path to that uh, special address, which is where the distributed service node is listening. So what I'm gonna do, uh, and this is all gonna happen pretty quickly, um, so first, on MHV1, I am going to ping its local address, which is 172.16.1.4. Okay, great, that worked. So now, I'm going to ping 5, which is on the other MHV, which is shown at the bottom there, okay? So that didn't work, which is exactly what we want. Destination unreachable. Now I'm going to start up the two distributed service nodes, so there's one, and here comes the second one. And you can see that it's got a forwarding list. It already knows the IP addresses of the, the two members of this particular VNI. It's sending a packet from, uh, one, from this MHV to the other MHV on VNI1. And then if we look over here, we'll see that the pings are in fact going through. And if we go back and have a look at this uh, monitoring tool here, you can actually see that now we have an entry, MHV1 has learned about uh, 172.16.1.5, which is on the other MHV. It has the MAC address for that. And similarly, MHV2 has learned about uh, the .4 address, which is on MHV1. In addition to that, if you have a look down here at the forwarding database, you can see that this MAC address is associated with the other MHV, so both of them have entries for that. So if we look one level of detail down, you'll also notice that this VXLAN, the entry for VXLAN 1 here is F661, or begins with F661, and that corresponds to VXLAN 1 over here, sorry, that corresponds to VXLAN 1 on the top right there, so that's, which is what we would expect. So that's just a regular ARP entry. But what's interesting is, if you have a look in the forwarding database, you can see that we also have that F661 address, but that's associated with the actual physical address, Ethernet 0. And that's because when, uh, when you want to send a packet from VXLAN 1 on MHV1 to MHV2, it looks up, it does an ARP request, and it looks at its ARP table, and it sees that, oh, uh, um, the dot five address is accessible via the F661 MAC address, so it fills that into its L2 frame. And then when the VTEP goes to forward it, it sees the MAC address, F661, 
and it knows that it has to forward it to the VTAP. So it encapsulates it, it forwards it to the VTAP, and it gets through to MHV2 there. So one last thing. Uh, if I go and kill this and clear all of the entries out of there and do the same thing on the other side, oops, my computer will hang. Uh, this was not supposed to be part of the demo. So, oh boy. So anyway, um, hopefully that'll come back. Uh, the point that I was trying to illustrate is if you do that, then you can see here that uh, the entry has been removed on the MHV1 side. I can do the same thing on the MHV2 side and then you'll see that the ping will actually stop. Um, but it looks like my computer is not too happy about that. Oh, there we go. Do we? Yes. All right. So here, so I'll clean out this and go back and now the host is unreachable. So just to prove that if we kill the distributed service node and we clean out those forwarding database and ARP entries, then, uh, then we can't reach it anymore. The interesting thing is if those entries are still there, even if the distributed service node goes down, they can still communicate with each other. So that's it as far as the demo. Uh, I captured a couple of slides there with the before shot and the after shot, uh, uh, if anybody's interested. So as far as future work, uh, I'd hope to actually be able to open source it and give you a link to the software, but I just ran out, out of time. So I'll be doing that very soon, probably in the next couple of weeks, I'll have the code up if anybody's interested in playing with it. It's, for what it does, it's actually remarkably simple. Uh, it's really not that complex. Um, if there's any interest, one of the nice things about this is that it will actually integrate with Neutron very, very easily. All you need to do is add a single option, a single configuration option to the VXLAN uh, interface creation uh, command that I showed you. It's basically that remote option. So you add that in and you can hook Neutron's VXLAN implementation into this, which is pretty neat. So if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to work on that. And then performance and scalability testing, that's something that, uh, that we're gonna be looking at in the future. So here are the references. So the slides you can download from here. Uh, the source code, and the source code's not available, but the Ansible playbooks are there. Actually, it took longer to get the Ansible playbooks to work than the actual source code. So feel free to download that. If you have any problems accessing it, or if you run into any issues or have any questions, feel free to contact me. My Twitter handle is there, and my IRC handle is there as well. We currently run VXLAN in production, uh, and our production implementation you can actually download now. It's pretty cool. It's a lot more optimized. It's actually multi-area VXLAN, uh, and it's highly optimized. We had some unique constraints in production that meant we really had to optimize uh, the implementation. Um, but it is, it's pretty, it requires some expertise to be able to configure and troubleshoot that. So um, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in that, you should certainly take a look. So here's a presentation that our chief architect, uh, Chet Burgess, uh, gave uh, uh, with, uh, with Nolan Leake uh, at the Atlanta summit. Here's, a good, uh, here's the RFC, which is actually really informative. There's uh, a very useful book on data center, uh, data center architectures, uh, McRouter, the McRouter codes there. One of the, probably the most useful thing you'll get out of the Ansible playbooks is how to actually compile and build McRouter. There's quite a few steps there, but that's all automated in those Ansible um, playbooks. And then a few, uh, there's the source code for McRouter uh, and some other tools that we've used. So, uh, any questions? Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure I saw this. This is nothing but Linux Bridge. It should work with the Linux Bridge agent just with that. Any, I mean, obviously you've gone to a lot of, a lot of work to make sure that you're doing that distributed cache right, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of processing there. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that versus um, scalability or speed of OVSDB VTEP schema updates? I, I don't know, I, the last time I worked on OVS was a couple of years ago actually, so I can't do any comparison. Um, uh, that's certainly something that we'll look at in the future and if anybody has any insight, I'd, I'd love to chat, uh, uh, chat with them about that. The thing that, that, one of the things that we really liked about this architecture, it's just really simple. I mean, there's really not that much to it. And so from a maintainability perspective in production, it means it's really easy to configure, it's really easy to stand up, you know, the, it's a horizontally scalable architecture. So, um, yeah, 
Any other questions? Uh, yes. So um, you had a thing with um, a single uh, service node and yes. how if it went down then the entire thing would go down. Yes. Um, what if you just had a cluster of service nodes? You could, definitely. Would, and so that would be you the same sort of say a bit. Um, well, okay, redundancy, whatever. The thing with the cluster of service nodes is then you, you need to add a whole layer uh, of, uh, you know, something like Corosync or Pacemaker to keep the cluster in quorum and have floating IPs or VIPs so that you can track that. And there's a fair amount of work there. You could actually do a similar thing. You could actually do that cluster using this approach as well. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Great. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody about it, so I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. <coughs> yep. Yes. Access control. Ah, so you mean as in uh, for connections that are coming in, uh, like uh, authentication? So I believe McGrouter has uh, support for uh, SSH access or, or certificates or something similar. I'm not sure, though. I haven't looked into that yet. But yeah, that's. Uh, oh, you mean so for the VMs that are spinning up? Yeah. Okay, so this is actually, this is really just focused on the service node uh, component, on distributing that service node functionality. How you manage VMs, you could do it, it it's independent of this. It's kind of another uh, orthogonal dimension. So you could do it however you normally do it. You could use OpenStack to manage that if you wanted to. Yes? You could, you can, and I think there is some work going on. So basically what you want to be able to do is add a feature into the kernel module so that you can pick which interface you want it to bind to. And I think, I think there's been work on that, but I, I don't know that it's been completed yet. Yep, great. All right, great, well thank you everybody.